Chapter Three of Stories of Animal Sagacity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Stories of Animal Sagacity by W. H. G. Kingston. Chapter Three Horses The Mare and Her Foal. The horse becomes the willing servant of man, and when kindly treated, looks upon him as a friend and protector. I have an interesting story to tell you of a mare which belonged to Captain I, an old settler in New Zealand. She and her foal had been placed in a paddock, between which, in her master's residence, three or four miles away, several high fences intervened. The paddock itself was surrounded by a still higher fence. One day, however, as Captain I was standing with a friend in front of his house, he was surprised to see the mayor come galloping up. Supposing that the fence of our paddock had been broken down, and that, pleased at finding herself at liberty, she had leaped the others, he ordered a servant to take her back. The mare willingly followed the man, but in a short time was seen galloping up towards the house in as great a hurry as before. The servant, who had arrived some time afterwards, assured his master that he had put the mare safely into the paddock. Captain I told him again to take back the animal and to examine the fence more thoroughly, still believing that it must have been broken down in some part or other, though the gate might be secure. Captain I and his friend then retired into the house and were seated at dinner when the sound of the horse's hoofs reached their ears. The friend, who had on this got up and looked out of the window, saw that it was the mayor come back for the third time, and observing the remarkable manner in which she was running up and down, apparently trying even to get into the house, exclaimed, what can that mare want i am sure that there is something the matter captain i on hearing this hurried out to ascertain the state of the case no sooner did the mare see him than she began to frisk about and exhibit the most lively satisfaction but instead of stopping to receive the accustomed caress off she set again of her own accord towards the paddock looking back to ascertain whether her master was following. His friend now joined him, and the mare, finding that they were keeping close behind her, trotted on till the gate of the paddock was reached, where she waited for them. On its being opened, she led them across the field to a deep ditch on the farther side, when, what was their surprise, to find that her colt, had fallen into it and was struggling on its back with its legs in the air, utterly unable to extricate itself. In a few minutes more, probably it would have been dead. The mayor, it was evident, finding that the servant did not comprehend her wishes, had again and again sought her master, in whom she had learned from past experience to confide. Here was an example of a strong maternal affection eliciting a faculty superior to instinct, which fully merits the name of reason. The aid of a kind master will always be sought in time of need. The conduct of the mayor speaks much in favor of her owner. It is evident that he treated her well. Had such not been the case, it is not at all likely that the animal would have persisted in coming direct to him in her time of need. Be ready, then, to fly for succor to those about whom you may have found willing to help and serve you. End of the Mayor and Her Foal The Newsman's Horse The memory of horses is most remarkable. The newsman of a provincial paper was in the habit of riding his horse once or twice a week to the houses of fifty or sixty of his customers, the horse invariably stopping of his own accord at each house as he reached it. But the memory of the horse was exhibited in a still more curious manner. It happened that there were two persons on the route 
who took one paper between them, and each claimed the privilege of having it first on each alternate week. The horse soon became accustomed to this regulation, and though the parties lived two miles distant, he stopped once a fortnight at the door of the half-customer at one place, and once a fortnight at the door of the half-customer at the other, and never did he forget this arrangement, which lasted for several years. If an animal can thus become so regular in his habits, and remember his duties so well as did this newsman's horse, surely you, my readers, whether young or old, have no excuse when you forget yours, and neglect to be at the appointed place at the proper time. End of The Newsman's Horse The Two Wise Cart Horses Cart horses, though heavy-looking animals, are more sagacious than their more gracefully formed relatives. A cart horse had been driven from a farmyard to the neighboring brook early one morning during winter to drink. The water was frozen over, and the horse stamped away with his four feet, but was unable to break the ice. Finding this, he waited till a companion came down, when the two, standing side by side, and causing their hoofs to descend together, broke through the ice, and were thus enabled to obtain the water they required. What one person alone cannot do, two working heartily together may accomplish. We shall find no lack of thick ice to break through. The thickest, perhaps, is the icy opposition of cold, stubborn hearts to what is right and good. Let us beware that our hearts do not freeze, but take care to keep them warm by exercising them in the service of love and kindness. End of The Two Wise Cart Horses The Author's Horse Becoming His Guide I was once traveling in the interior of Portugal with several companions. My horse had never been in that part of the country before. We left our inn at daybreak and proceeded through a mountainous district to visit some beautiful scenery. On our return, evening was approaching when I stopped behind my companions to tighten the girths of my saddle. Believing that there was only one path to take, I rode slowly on, but shortly reached a spot where I was in some doubt whether I should go forward or turn to the left. I shouted, but heard no voice in reply, nor could I see any trace of my friends. Darkness was coming rapidly on. My horse seeming inclined to take the left hand, I thought it best to let him do so. In a short time, the sky became overcast, and there was no moon. The darkness was excessive. Still, my steed stepped boldly on. So dense became the obscurity that I could not see his ears, nor could I, indeed, distinguish my own hand held out at arm's length. I had no help for it but to place the reins on my horse's neck and let him go forward. We had heard of robberies and murders committed, and I knew that there were steep precipices, down which, had my horse fallen, we should have been dashed to pieces. Still, the firm way in which he trotted gave me confidence. Hour after hour passed by. The darkness would, at all events, conceal me from the banditti, if such were in wait. That was one consolation. But then I could not tell where my horse might be taking me. It might be far away from where I hoped to find my companions. At length, I heard a dog bark and saw a light twinkling far down beneath me, by which I knew that I was still on the mountainside. Thus, on my steady steed proceeded, till I found that he was going along a road, and I fancied I could distinguish the outlines of trees on either hand, Suddenly, he turned on one side, when my hat was nearly knocked off by striking against the beam of a trellised porch covered with vines, and to my joy I found he had brought me up to the door of the inn which we had left in the morning. 
my companions, trusting to their human guide, had not arrived, having taken longer, though safer, route. My steed had followed the direct path over the mountains which we had pursued in the morning. Another horse of mine, which always appeared a gentle animal, and which constantly carried a lady, was, during my absence, ridden by a friend with spurs. On my return, I found he had on several occasions attacked his rider, when dismounted, with his forefeet, and had once carried off the rim of his hat. From that time forward, he would allow no one to approach him if he saw spurs on his heels, and I was obliged to blindfold him when mounting and dismounting, as he, on several occasions, attacked me as he had done my friend. My horse had, till that time, been a willing, quiet animal. How many human beings have, by thoughtless, cruel treatment, been turned from faithful servants? into implacable foes. I must urge my young readers always to treat those who may be dependent on them with kindness and gentleness, rather because it is their duty to do so, than from fear of the consequence of an opposite course. End of the author's horse becoming his guide. The wise horse and the pump. A horse was shut up in a paddock near Leeds, in a corner of which stood a pump with a tub beneath it. The groom, however, often forgot to fill the tub, the horse having thus no water to drink. The animal had observed the way in which water was procured, and one night, when the tub was empty, was seen to take the pump handle in his mouth and work it with his head till he had procured as much water as he required. What a wise horse he was! How much wiser than some young ladies and gentlemen, who, when there is no water in their jugs, or their shoes are not cleaned, dress without washing rather than take the trouble of getting it for themselves, or wear dirty shoes rather than take them down to be cleaned, or clean them for themselves. My young friends, remember through life that sensible horse. Take the pump by the handle and work away with it till you have brought up the water. End of the wise horse and the pump. The pony which saved a little girl's life. A small pony belonging to a gentleman in Warwickshire was fed in a park through which a canal passes. It was a great favorite, having been long kept in the family and was ridden by the children. A little girl, the daughter of the owner of the property, had run out by herself into the park and made her way to the banks of the canal. As she was playing thoughtlessly near the water, she fell in. Her cries attracted the pony, which, galloping forward, plunged into the water and, lifting her in his mouth, brought her safely to the shore. However weak or apparently inadequate your means, you may often, if you employ them to the best of your power, render essential service to your fellow creatures. End of the pony which saved the little girl's life. The horse and the shipwreck. A remarkable instance of a horse saving a human life occurred some years ago at the Cape of Good Hope. A storm was raging when a vessel, dragging her anchors, was driven on the rocks and speedily dashed to pieces. Many of those on board perished. The remainder were seen clinging to the wreck or holding on to the fragments which were washing to and fro amid the breakers. No boat could put off. When all hope had gone of saving the unfortunate people, a settler, somewhat advanced in life, appeared on horseback on the shore. His horse was a bold and strong animal, and noted for excelling as a swimmer. The farmer moved with compassion for the unfortunate seamen, resolved to attempt saving them. Fixing himself firmly in the saddle, he pushed into the midst of the breakers. At first, both horse and rider disappeared, but they were soon buffeting the waves and swimming towards the wreck. Calling two of the seamen, he told them to hold on by his boots. Then, turning his horse's head, he brought them safely to land. 
No less than seven times did he repeat this dangerous exploit, thus saving fourteen lives. For the eighth time he plunged in, when, encountering a formidable wave, the brave man lost his balance and was instantly overwhelmed. The horse swam safely to the shore, but his gallant rider, alas, was no more. It is sinful, uselessly, to run even a slight risk of losing life. But when, on any occasion, need arises for saving the lives of our fellow creatures, we should be willing to dare the greatest dangers in making such an effort. The fate of the brave farmer must not deter us, nor should any failure of others, from doing what is only our duty. End of the Horse and the Shipwreck THE IRISH HORSE AND THE INFANT Mrs. F. mentions several instances of the sagacity of horses. Some horses in the county of Limerick, which were pastured in a field, broke bounds like a band of unruly schoolboys, and scrambling through a gap which they had made in a fence, found themselves in a narrow lane. Along the quiet by-road, they galloped helter-skelter at full speed, snorting and tossing their manes in the full enjoyment of their freedom, but greatly to the terror of a party of children who were playing in the lane. As the horses were seen tearing wildly along, the children scrambled up the bank into the hedge and buried themselves in the bushes, regardless of thorns, with the exception of one poor little thing, who, too small to run, fell down on his face and lay crying loudly in the middle of a narrow way. On swept the horses, but when the leader of the troop saw the little child lying in his path, he suddenly stopped, and so did the others behind him. Then, stooping his head, he seized the infant's clothes with his teeth and carefully lifted it to the side of the road, laying it gently and quite unhurt on the tender grass. He and his companions then resumed their gallop in the lane, unconscious of having performed a remarkable act. Learn a lesson from those wild Irish horses. As you hurry along in the joyousness of youth, reflect and look before you to see whether there lies not on your road someone who requires your help. Believe me, in your path through life, you will find many poor little infants who require to be lifted up and placed in safety. Do not be less obedient to the promptings of duty than were those dumb animals to the reason or instinct implanted in their breasts. End of the Irish Horse and the Infant the humane cart horse and the child. A carter in Strathmiglo, Fifeshire, had an old horse which was as familiar with his family as a dog could have been. He used to play with the children, and when they were running about between his legs, he would never move for fear of doing them an injury. On one occasion, when dragging a loaded cart through a narrow lane near the village, a young child not one of his owner's family, happened to be playing on the road and thoughtlessly ran directly before him when, had it not been for his sagacity, he would inevitably have been crushed by the wheels. On seeing what had occurred, the good old horse took the child up by its clothes with its teeth, carried it a few yards, and then placed it by the wayside, moving slowly all the while and looking back occasionally as if to satisfy himself that the cart wheels had passed clear of it. In all his duties, he was equally steady and precise, and could be perfectly trusted. That is just the character you should aim at deserving. To merit being perfectly trusted shows that your talent is employed to the best advantage, that you are laboring, really and truly, from a conscious sense of duty. Only thus, Will you labor honestly? End of the Humane Cart Horse and the Child The Fateful Horse and His Rider Horses have been known to fight for their friends, both human and canine. 
A farmer near Edinburgh possessed a hunter which had carried him safely for many a day over moorland heath as well as beaten roads. He was one day returning from the city, where he had attended a jovial meeting, when, feeling more than usually drowsy, he slipped from his saddle to the ground, without being awakened by the change of position, and letting go the bridle as he fell. His faithful steed, which had the character of being a vicious horse, instead of galloping home, as might have been expected, stood by his prostrate master, keeping as strict a watch over him as a dog could have done. Some laborers, coming at daybreak, observed the farmer still sleeping near a heap of stones by the roadside. Intending to assist him, they drew near, when the horse, by his grinning teeth and ready heels, showed them that it would be wiser to keep at a distance. He did not, probably, understand their humane intentions, but not till they had aroused the farmer, who at length got on his feet, would his equine guardian allow them to proceed. Mrs. F. mentions another instance of a high-spirited Irish horse, which, under similar circumstances, used to defend his master. This man, a dissipated character, often coming home at night tipsy, would fall to the ground in a helpless state. Had the horse, while the man was in this condition, forsaken him, he would have been run over by any vehicle passing along the road. But the faithful horse was his vigilant guardian and protector. If nobody approached, the animal would stand patiently beside his prostrate master till he came to himself. He has been known to stand at his post during the whole of the night. If anyone came near, he would gallop round him, kicking out his heels, or rearing and biting, if an attempt were made to touch him. Thus, the man and the animal changed places, the intelligent brute protecting both himself and his brutalized master. I have a word to say even on this subject. Beware, lest you take the first step which may lead you to become like the man I have described. You cannot expect, like him, to have a sagacious horse to watch over you. Yet at the same time, do not be less faithful to an erring companion than were those noble steeds to their owners. Watch over and protect him to the utmost. Learn to be kind to the thankful and to the unthankful. End of The Fateful Horse and His Rider Jack and His Driver Mr. Smiles, in his Life of Rennie, tells us of a horse called Jack, who showed himself to be fully as sensible as the two animals just mentioned. Jack's business was to draw the stone trucks along the tramway during the erection of Waterloo Bridge. Near at hand was a beer shop, frequented by the navies and carters. Jack's driver, named Tom, was an honest fellow and very kind to Jack but too fond of spending more time than he ought to have done in the beer shop. Jack, though a restive animal, got accustomed to Tom's habits and waited patiently till an overlooker startled him into activity. On one occasion, however, the superintendent being absent, Tom took so long a spell at the ale that Jack became restive, and the trace fastenings being long enough, the animal put his head inside the beer house door, and seizing the astonished Tom by the collar with his teeth, dragged him out to his duty at the truck. Great in consequence became the fame of Jack amongst the host of laborers. Like famous Jack, do not hesitate to remind a friend of his duty, even though you have to seize him by the collar and drag him away to perform it. End of Jack and His Driver The Horse Which Fought for a Dog I have given several instances of friendship existing between horses and dogs. A fine hunter had formed a friendship with a handsome greyhound, which slept in the stable with him, and generally accompanied him when taken out for exercise. When the greyhound accompanied his master in his walks, 
the horse would look over his shoulder and neigh in a manner which plainly said let me go also and when the dog returned he was received with an unmistakable neigh of welcome he would lick the horse's nose and in return the horse would scratch his back with his teeth on one occasion the groom had as usual taken out the horse for exercise followed by the greyhound when a savage dog attacked the latter and bore him to the ground the horse seeing this threw back his ears and breaking from the groom rushed at the strange dog which was attacking his friend seized him by the back with his teeth speedily making him quit his hold and shook him till a piece of his skin gave way the offender getting on his feet scampered off glad to escape from a foe which could punish him so severely end of the horse which fought for a dog the arab steed and the chief monsieur de lamartine's beautiful story of the arab chief and his favorite steed has often been told it shall form one of our anecdotes of horses a chief abu el marik and his marauding tribe had one night attacked a caravan when returning with their plunder they were surrounded by the troops of the pacha of acre who killed several and bound the rest with cords abu el marik wounded and faint from loss of blood was among the latter thus bound while lying on the ground at night he heard the neigh of his favorite steed picketed a short distance off anxious to caress the horse for the last time he dragged himself up to him poor friend he said what will you do among these savage tugs shut up under the stifling roof of a khan you will sicken and die no longer will the women and children of the tent bring you barley camel's milk in the hollow of their hands no longer will you gallop free as the wind across the desert no longer cleave the waters with your breast and lave your sides in the pure stream if i am to be a slave at least you shall go free hasten back to our tent tell my wife that abu el marik will return no more with these last words his hands being tied the old chief undid by means of his teeth the rope which held the courser fast but the noble animal instead of galloping away to the desert bent his head over his master and seeing him there helpless on the ground took his clothes gently between his teeth and lifting him up set off at full speed towards his distant home arriving there he laid his master at the feet of his wife and children and dropped down dead with fatigue what a brave example of affection duty and self-sacrifice you may never be called on to perform the one hundredth part of the task undertaken willingly by that gallant arab steed but how are you carrying the tiny light burdens which your everyday duties place on you true heroism consists not so much in the performance of one noble deed which may become the poet's theme but in doing all that we have to do and in seeking to do as much as we can of what there is to be done to the very best of our power and in bearing with patience what we are called on to bear end of the arab steed and the chief the old charger the horse has been frequently known to recognize his rider after a long absence he is also especially a sociable animal and once accustomed to others of his kind rarely forgets them at the trumpet sound the old war horse pricks up his ears snorts and paws the ground eager to join his ancient comrades some years ago the assistant to a surveyor was employed to ride along a certain line of turnpike road to see that the contractors were doing their work properly he was mounted on a horse which had belonged to a field officer and though aged still possessed much spirit 
It happened that a troop of yeomanry were out exercising on a neighboring common. No sooner did the old horse espy the line of warriors and hear the bugle call, than, greatly to the dismay of his rider, he leaped the fence and was speedily at his post in front of the regiment. Nor could the civilian equestrian induce him by any means to quit the ground till the regiment left it. As long as they kept the field, the horse remained in front of the troop, and then insisted on marching at their head into the town, prancing as well as his old legs would allow him to, to the great amusement of the volunteers, and the no small annoyance of the clerk, who had thus been compelled to assume a post which he would have gladly avoided. Old habits cling to us as pertinaciously as did those of that ancient war steed, and often when we flatter ourselves that they have been overcome, temptation appears, and we yield to them as of yore. Do you, my young friends, take heed to adopt only good habits and adhere to them? End of the old charger. End of chapter three of Stories of Animal Sagacity.